have your Bibles, you can turn to Proverbs 14. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, uh, for those being here today. Thank you for the singers. Uh, thank you for the, the lyrics, uh, Father, to those songs. Uh, Father, we give you all the praise and the honor. Pray that you give me clarity of thought, liberty of speech. Pray, Father, that you'd be merciful to me. I plead the blood of anything might be unclean, uh, that you could fill me. Pray that you'd be with the hearers, that they'd ask to be filled. In Jesus' name, amen going to be some introductory uh, material before we go into the sermon, <clears throat> but for as long as Americans can remember, uh, the nation has celebrated the 4th of July by staging grand fireworks, shows in public squares, uh, lighting smaller displays at home, and why do we commemorate? Well, because John Adams wanted us to. Yes, he did. Before the Declaration of Independence was even signed, he envisioned fireworks as, as fireworks as part of festivities and uh, in a letter to Abigail Adams on July 3rd 1776 he wrote uh, that the occasion should be commemorated with pomp and parade and shoes games sports guns bells bonfires and illuminations uh, from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore uh, the first commemorative Independence Day fireworks were set off on July 4th, uh, 1777. Uh, the Pennsylvania Evening Post wrote that in Philadelphia, uh, the evening was closed with the ring of bells, and at night there was a grand exhibition of fireworks, which began and concluded with 13 rockets on the commons, and the city was beautifully illuminated. The paper noted that everything was conducted with the greatest order and decorum, and the face of joy and gladness was universal. Uh, the same year, fireworks also lit up the sky in Boston, uh, where they were exhibiting uh, by uh, Colonel Thomas Crafts uh, over the common by 1783, a large variety of fireworks were available to the public. In 1784, one merchant offered a range of pyrotechniques that included rockets, serpents, wheels, table rockets, cherry trees, fountains, and sunflowers. When? 1783. So it's been around a while. Don't let them say it's a modern thing. It started with our country. So that's why we do what we do. And I like that decently and in order, the way the people did that. Now, and I'm going to read some things here, so just be patient and maybe you'll learn something new or Maybe you'll just uh, add to what you already know. Uh, under God and the Pledge of Allegiance. The words under God were taken from Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address uh, that this nation under God shall have a new birth and were added to the Pledge of Allegiance on June 14, 1954 by a joint resolution of Congress, 243. And it was considered public law 83-396. The pledge was initially adapted by the 79th Congress on December 28, 1945, as Public Law 287. On June 14, 1954, President Eisenhower signed into law the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Eisenhower gave this support to the Congressional Act, which added the phrase, under God, to the Pledge of Allegiance. This is what he said. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall co constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons, which forever will be our country's most powerful research, resource in peace or war. 
President Eisenhower then stood on the steps of the Capitol building and recited the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time with the phrase, One Nation Under God. Pretty good, huh? I think so. Now, in America, nobody says you have to keep the circumstances somebody else gives you. Who said that? Amy Tan. My country, tis of thee, thee, was written by a Baptist minister, Samuel Francis Smith. The Pledge of Allegiance was written in 1892 by a Baptist minister, Francis Bellamy. You didn't know that, did you? You know it now. The words in God we trust are traced to the efforts of Reverend W.R. Watkinson. Reverend John Witherspoon, a Presbyterian minister, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Now, the choice before us is plain. Christ or chaos, conviction or compromise, discipline or disintegration. I am rather tired of hearing about our rights and privileges as American citizens. The time has come, it is now, when we ought to hear about the duties and responsibilities of our citizenship. America's future depends upon her accepting and demonstrating God's government. Peter Marshall. Remember, democracy, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. John Adams. It's good to go over these things. You can get some wisdom, can't you? This is from George Washington in his farewell address. Do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. George Washington's farewell address to the nation. That's pretty good, man. I'm telling you. No wonder they don't want to teach the founding fathers and George Washington and all those patriotic things in school. General Omar Bradley said, you know the Bradley tank? Anyway, <laughs> this is what he said. America today is running on the momentum of a godly ancestry. And when that momentum runs down, God help America. Bradley also said, we have grasped the mystery of the Adam and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. The world has achieved brilliance without conscience. Ours is a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants. That's profound, people. These are thinkers in our country that we didn't listen to. And this is a good fellow. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by, not, but by uh, religionists, but by Christians. Not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Henry. And here's one from Benjamin Franklin. We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this. I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Benjamin Franklin. So much for a deist there. It sounds pretty personal to me. And uh, here's some more. Only in America. Only in America can a pizza get to your house faster than an ambulance. Only in America are there handicapped parking places in front of a skating rink. Only in America do drug stores make the sick walk all the way to the back of the store to get their prescriptions while healthy people can buy cigarettes at the front. Only in America do people order double cheeseburgers, large fries, and a Diet Coke. Only in America do people order, again, Double cheeseburgers, last fries, and Diet Coke. Only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and put our junk in the garage. And then after it says, hello. Yeah. Only in America do we use answering machines to screen calls and have call waiting so we won't miss a call from someone we didn't want to talk to in the first place. Only in America do we buy hot dogs in packages of 10 and Buns and packages of eight. The inscription on the Statue of Liberty, written by Emma Lazarus, 
Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That's heavy, isn't it? How about this one? No king but Jesus. The colonists grew in their resilience and confidence in God, the point where one uh, crown-appointed uh, governor wrote of the condition to the Board of uh, Trade back in England. Uh, this is what he said. If you ask an American who, who, who is his master, he will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. Well, we come a long way, didn't we? The committees of correspondence soon began sounding the cry across the colonies, no king but King Jesus. This country. This country. In uh, <clears throat> Dr. James Kennedy, now uh, Presbyterian and other things in Florida, he passed on. He had some good things for patriots. Let's quote from him. History fails to record a single precedent in which, in which nations subject to moral decay have not passed into political and economic decline. There has been either a spiritual awakening to overcome the moral lapse or a progressive deterioration leading to ultimate national disaster. That was Douglas MacArthur, I'm sorry, General Douglas MacArthur. Now, James Kennedy said this, in reading over the constitutions of all 50 of our states, I discovered something which some of you may not know. There is in all 50, without exception, an appeal or a prayer to the almighty God of the universe. Now, through all 50 state constitutions, without exception, there runs this same appeal in reference to God, who is the creator of our liberties and the preserver of our freedoms. People in the progressive states, including California, uh, Illinois, New York, they ought to read their own constitution. Our John Quincy Adams again. I speak as a man of the world to men of the world. I say to you, search the scriptures. The Bible is the book of all others to be read at all ages and in all conditions of human life. Not to be read once or twice or thrice through and then laid aside, but to be read in small portions of one of two chapters every day and never to be intermitted unless by some overruling necessity. Wow. Is there more? Oh, man. Hundreds, thousands of quotes by our founding fathers, those in authority, judges, governors, in this country, this country. Proverbs 14, preach a message on God's message to America. And in Proverbs 14, in verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Individually, group, anything. But we're talking about national here. The verse just cries out against our country. And should. Now, you think about uh, most of us place a high value on personal messages uh, from letters, mass mailings, etc. And uh, we think about how refreshing it is to have a personal note from a personal organization sometimes. They've even caught on to that. You'll get uh, personal letters to yourself, and you know it's a form letter. But it's nice for them to consider that, isn't it? Now, today it is difficult to tell what personal correspondence and what is mass mailing. Sometimes it may seem the same with scriptures. While many preachers apply passages written for Israel to America, our text is to America. In fact, it is a blanket statement to any nation. What would God say to America if he spoke audibly to us this 4th of July holiday? And uh, you think about this. I believe he would remind us of this verse, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, these truths still hold true for any nation today. Now, history is littered with echoes of failed nations, Nineveh, Egypt, the Egyptian dynasty, Greece, the Roman Empire. 
Now, today, the United States is proof text for this verse. Number one, the righteousness of a nation. Righteousness. Well, the first word of our verse is righteousness. It is a word seldom uttered outside of the conservative churches today. You don't hear our politicians speak about righteousness. You don't hear the news media say anything about it. Now, there is at least three implications of the word righteousness. Number one, it implies sovereignty. They hate that because they, it implies Calvinism, they think. No, God is everywhere. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He is sovereign. If there's such a thing as righteousness, then someone sovereign must determine what it is. Human, mankind, has a very idea of righteousness. We could never in a million years agree on what is righteous and what is unrighteous. God, however, is an authority on righteousness. He really is. You don't have to turn to these verses. I'm going to speedily go through these three points, hopefully. Psalms 71.19 says this. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things? O God, who is like unto thee? And then Psalms 98.2 says, The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly shewed in the sight of the heathen. Who did? God did. Who does it belong to? God. Who's righteous? God is. How do we know what righteousness is? God tells us what it is. So who do we believe? The world, the definitions of the world, or do we believe God? We believe God. And if you believe God, you must have God's word. Yes, you may. You may, you may have all these different 200 and something translations if you want. I mean, you can fight over them, but we know which one proved itself over 400 years. And they call it a king. It is definitely a king. King James Bible is the absolute authority. We place all of our life and hope in its words. It has clear definitions like we've been reading right now. So it implies sovereignty. It implies a standard. Society today does not want a standard. They will not even acknowledge that one exists. You know that's true. This is the main reason that the Word of God has been attacked and ridiculed by unbelievers. In Psalms 119.40, it says, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Psalms 119.142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. At the founding of our nation, the Bible was held in high esteem. There are both direct and indirect quotations in the uh, correspondence of the founding fathers. Why don't people know that? They don't read the founding fathers. Who's the founding? They don't even know who they are in this country. Three, it implies a straightness. It is one thing to admit that there's a standard. It is quite another to make that standard your own. The word in our text intimates a personal righteousness, a personal morality. The Judeo-Christian ethic has guided our nation uh, from its founding up until the generation in which we live. Our forefathers chose the righteousness of the Bible as its guiding light. A verse for that is you'll do it on your own, Deuteronomy 4, 5. So one, the righteousness of a nation, righteousness. Two, the reward of a nation. What's that? Exalteth a nation. Who can doubt that America has been exalted among the nations? Now some Americans like, <laughs> some Americans do, like Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, uh, he takes uh, credit for such exaltation. Now, the mentality is that we somehow deserve the greatness and power of our past. That's a sad mistake to make. America has been exalted because of its citizens' goodness and personal holiness. America has been exalted because of the churches that have carried out the Great Commission, both at home and abroad. It's because of past obedience and humility that we now enjoy permanent place on the world scene. And let me not, not forget, we're friends with Israel the nation of Israel. I mean, righteousness exalteth a nation. Now, the exalted nation is set apart. 
One of the meanings of the word exalt is to be lifted up, to be made high. Now, the Bible teaches us that God himself is exalted. The scripture is exalted. And Israel is exalted above the nations. But in this verse, we find a promise that the righteous nation also will be lifted up and made high. Uh, Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalms 37, 34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Surely there is no nation in the history of the world which has been lifted up and exalted more than America. I mean, the United States has dominated history throughout the 20th century. Never forget that. Don't go to sleep on me now. I'm tired. Anyway. Think about that, exalted. Think about our nation. Think about how long we've made it and how much we took it for granted like it's going to be there. The greatest thing I think ever happened to our country, really, to show us all the quiet majority and the grassroots is when Hillary ran. Whoa. I got goose pimples now just thinking about what that stirred up. People were working, paying their bills. They're sick of what's going on. They're sick of seeing him around. They're sick of their grandkids coming out of college. They're sick of what's going on and what they were taught. They were hoodwinked. They were tricked because they were too busy working for a living, trying to be good people and raise good people. And all of a sudden, boom, everything's a mess. And they said to themselves, man, I wasn't vigilant. I thought doing this, I could trust my government. I'd give them all the stake and money they wanted. As long as my kids grew up right, they took God from them. Took capitalism, put Marxism in there. Hate it. Good. You need to hate it. You need to hate it. You need to go back and read the forefathers. Get patriotic. You're going to find out in all them writings, God is in there. All thy getting, get God. <laughs> think about uh, an exalted state. You think about uh, an exalted nation is safe. Another sub meaning of the word exalt is to raise high as an uh, inaccessible fortress. That means it's out of reach of danger. Psalm 32 7 Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble, thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. In Psalms 119, 114, thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Many nations have been destroyed by their enemies or by God himself through natural disasters. We're talking plagues, pestilence, war. And unbelief has destroyed many countries. But America celebrates her birthday this July 4th with a testament to God's protection and preservation. Exalted nation, another definition is strong. It's to, it's to triumph over enemies. A mere glance at the history of America revealed the hand of God's protection watching over us in war and peace. Think of the odds of the colonies defeating the most powerful nation in the 18th century world, the British Empire. Yet it happened. We take for granted our victory in the Revolutionary War. We assumed that our power then resembled our power today. Not true. It was a miracle from God that America gained her freedom from England. Why did the Civil War not tear this nation apart? Could it have been the protection of God? In World War II, America took on much of the world, essentially single-handedly, and assured freedom throughout the globe. Now, there was a time when our citizens proudly said, America has never lost a war. We must give God the glory for the past victories, for he has protected us. In Psalms 144.1, it says, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Never forget, we're strong because of God also. Now, thirdly, we think about, let me go over the points here. 
the righteousness of a nation, the reward of a nation, thirdly, the revolt of a nation. Where do you see that? In that verse, it has but sin. We now come to the depressing aspects of God's promise to any nation. As surely as righteousness exalts a nation, sin destroys it. God says so in the very same verse. Now today, many people want a buffet-style religion. They want a God who is merciful, loving, and kind. The God of Christianity fulfills that desire, but the God of mercy and love is also the God of judgment and damnation. People turn away from such a God. But here's the problem. This verse is a couplet having two parts. The parts are opposite and contrasting. But one cannot be accepted without the other. They stand together as a testimony of God's unapproachable holiness. The truth is that God will judge sin. He will not wink at it, forget it, or misplace his records. Now, to understand this truth, let us examine the meaning of the word sin. Sin is an undisciplined aim. To sin is to miss the mark, as an archer misses his target. Psalms 2.1 says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Mankind is bound to fail, seeing we are only flesh. But our sinful nature is not an excuse. Missing God's mark is the result of an undisciplined aim, a car careless shot at God's perfection. America does not demand greatness of itself anymore, and that is true. Whether they work on your car, your house, whatever anybody does, when you get somebody that demands greatness, you don't want to lose them. I don't care if it's a barber, I don't care. When they pass on, you say, oh, man, I hope his son took over. And a lot of times the son dumps on the family, gets the money, and books. And it's almost like there, I think it was when they went into Egypt, when they came out, they forgot all their, their special trades that they knew before then. It wasn't passed on to the next generations. Great things were lost. And we're living in this country, you talk about sin, one of the, uh, one of the main signs is nobody demands greatness anymore. Why? It's not PC. To demand greatness demands discipline. To do that, you're, somebody's going to have to tell you you're doing something wrong. And you need to do it right. So far, thank goodness for General Mattis. Oh. They're all trying to ruin the Marines. Giving little pink slips I heard in the Air Force from somebody that's there. You know, if the guy's too abusive to you, the drill instructor, whatever, you can peace out. What in the world? Imagine going before ISIS, oh, that hurt. Please, don't yell at me. We don't yell at you. My goodness. Get some demands back. They don't like Trump because he's a parent. Yeah, he's got his faults, but bless God, he's right on with that character thing. That's wrong, this is right. That's wrong, this is right. May not say it right sometimes, but bless God, I mean, the stuff that he's on, he's on. He knows business. He knows what makes a good business. Ain't cream puffs, I'm telling you that now. Well, unless you're in the fashion industry, I guess. Huh? Now, we do not honor what is good and right. Contrary wise, we honor and reward the evil and the forward. And you just look at our culture. Uh, the bad guy is now the norm. The good guy is the potential hypocrite who bears watching. A fitting illustration uh, can be found in the sporting world. Uh, former Atlanta Braves pitcher John Rocker made international headlines when he spoke out against homosexuals and other perverted lifestyles in the magazine. He was assailed as intolerant and a bigot. His teammate Chipper Jones was engaged to be married, but impregnated a hooker's waitress and reportedly tried to talk her into an abortion. She refused, had the baby, and Jones' fiance called off the marriage. Yet Chipper Jones was sought out by the media to comment on Rocker's verbal transgressions. Why? The bad guy has been what? 
turn into the good guy, such as society's undisciplined aim at righteousness. I mean, Isaiah says they're going to say bad is good and good is bad. Isn't that something? I mean, the more you think about it, the more you read, you're saying, wow, even if I was an atheist, I'd start thinking, man, whoever wrote this, like, had it down, like, man, 3,000 years ago. Wow, how could he do that? Wow, he must have been outside and saw everything. Wow, he must know. Whoa, there must be a God. Duh. Sin is un, an unwise assurance. Another meaning of sin is a, to stumble to err from the path. Again, it seems that we have a built-in excuse. Which of us has not stumbled from the path through no fault of our own? It is human nature to fail, to stumble. Our stumbling and erring from the path comes from a false assurance, a careless attitude. America has taken for granted the blessings of God, assuming that he will continue to bless and protect us in spite of our sin. But Psalms 59, 12 says, For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. Sin is ungrateful actions. Studying the book of Romans starts off in chapter 1. Tells you right off the bat. We go through that whole list. You, can, you rail on people, you know, the sodomites and other things, and you miss the first part. Unthankful. I mean, that starts the downfall. Be unthankful. Just be unthankful. Don't thank God. And, man, that's like opens up the door all those other things. Man, think about that. Daniel, uh, in uh, Daniel 9-11 says, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, because we have sinned against him. And in 1 John 3-4 it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. And so the ungrateful actions is an outright transgression, a rebellion against God. And then the reproach of a nation, the fourth point, he says, is a reproach. Sin is a reproach. First mention of the word reproach in our English Bible can be found in Genesis 30, 23. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. Now Eve had borne a son whom she expected to be the promised Messiah. Her reproach was the curse that God placed on her because of Adam's sin. Sin brings a reproach, whether it is in this life of the individual or in the timeline of a nation. Again, we examine the different meanings of our text. Disgraced is one definition of reproach, is to be brought low, to go from heights to the depths. Wow. In Nehemiah 1.3, Nehemiah reported, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Israel's sin had caused them to go into captivity, and now their capital city stood in ruins. The remnant was brought low by their sin. We, too, have been brought from the heights to the, I'm telling you, if you think about the sins of our people have, in America, how low we've descended. God is bound to judge sin. He will not turn a blind eye to America's folly. As he judged Israel and the heathen nations, he will also judge us. That's no secret. No secret. Now, when I think about this trinity we possess, body, soul, and spirit, what a wonderful thing to be born again. Oh, my soul. What a wonderful thing to know that those mysteries that they didn't know in the Old Testament wouldn't, wouldn't have been a mystery. 
God gave Paul the revelation of so many of the mysteries. Wow. You almost think sometimes, Romans 11, when uh, it talks about because of the Jews' stubbornness and blindness, in part, we got in. If they would have had the revelation of some of the mysteries, maybe they would have had a different mindset. I don't know. I'm just glad the way God worked this thing out. Because I know the promises given to the church. And they are different than the promises to Israel. But I also know the difference between standing and state. And I know any of us can mess up any time in this state we're in. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. We're not led by the Spirit, we'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. All these verses God has given us so that we can live upright, righteous in the presence of God, knowing salvation is of the Lord, knowing we don't have our own righteousness to get saved, but it was the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was imputed to us. What a blessing that is to know that. But it doesn't limit us to walk in righteousness. Because now that we know this, we have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We can let Christ that's in us work through us doing righteous acts. Therefore, fulfilling Scripture. What a blessing to know this stuff. Most United States don't know that. Most United States don't even have an absolute authority. So you have this as a reproach. And... Uh, Another definition of reproach is to be ridiculed, to rail on, to revile. In 1 Samuel 17, 26, young David said this, What shall be done to the man that killeth his, this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Or who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Israel was powerless in the face of Goliath and the Philistines. Certainly they were ridiculed, reviled by their inability. Goliath mocked the army of Israel and the whole nation. Now America knows something about such disgrace. We are the richest and most developed nation in the world, but we are reviled by much of the world. The Muslim nations in communist China have little respect for our system of government or our culture. We were reviled and ridiculed by the former Soviet Union until God brought them low. So don't think that the same thing cannot happen to us. Never forget. Reproach, dishonor, defeated. The final definition of reproach means to pluck or strip away all that is good. Our culture is in the process of doing just that. Our defeat has not come at the hands of foreign invader. It has come at our own hands. The silent majority that Richard Nixon spoke of years ago has been splintered into carpeting special interests. Politicians pit one group against another to keep us divided. The city of Ai was a little speck on the map of the Isra Israelite army. After the great victory at Jericho, Ai would be a simple campaign, a mopping up exercise. But the sin of one man, one man, brought defeat. I believe that the sin that is defeating America is found in the church rather than the culture. Yes, our culture is rotten, our society is eaten up with evil, but the Christian Achans are hoarding up the world's gold and garments and allowing the gospel witness to fall silent. Somebody says, all you preach about is, my goodness, read the Bible, pray. Pass out tracks. Well, that's because the track rack is still full. <laughs> I mean, bless your little heart. Sometimes we'll forget a checkbook. Sometimes we'll forget our money, and maybe your girls in another purse, or or guys maybe you know just forgot to put the money in their hidden place in their wallet, and we freak out over stuff like that. But to uh, have people dying and going to hell, and you don't even care. See, we're forgetting about who's protecting the country and us. It don't matter how good you think you are. If you lose God's protection on your life, you got a problem. We must have, must have that protection. 
And then in conclusion, yes, conclusion, America has been great because of God. If we, if we fall, it will be because of our failure to honor God as our authority and Lord. Um, you think about, must we watch our beloved land become mired in the slow of compromise and fearfulness? It is the Christian that must stand up for what is right. We must not fear the wrath of man or the condemnation of sinners. They hated Jesus. So if we are the light which exposes their evil, they will hate us as well. What would God's personal message be to America? Be if he spoke to the, un, you think, unaudibly this day. If he spoke to us audibly in this day, I believe he would say righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is reproached to any people. Any people, any people. Now think about yourself today in relation to this great country. Maybe some of the quotes went over your head. Or maybe you need to just read some stuff that you never read before, like get online and find out what the forefathers said about this country. Find out the God that's mentioned in all the writings, divine creator. We're talking about declaration of independence starts off. I told somebody, just like the Bible, you're not going to fear God or even hear from God if you don't believe the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And if you go to that Declaration of Independence and you can't see the alien of rights and you can't see endowed by the Creator, you can't get past that, you got no business reading the Constitution. Because the heartbeat of that Constitution and those amendments are from people that believe in God. You watch the news and you're trying to compare. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you in all things. Stop being hoodwinked. Sick of them stamping UAW or Teamsters and everybody goes, oh yeah, they must be right. You're stupid. They promoted people that took your guns away. They promoted baby killers. See, when you vote with your wallet, not a problem. Look where everything's at now. Whew. Retirement ain't going to be the same if the bank's closed. <laughs> Talk about medical. You don't need to start over. <laughs> Do it right. So we're here today. We're Baptists. We're Bible believers. We've got an absolute authority. You need to take that in consideration as you leave the church. And don't forget your heritage. Do not forget your heritage. I mean, think about what God would say to us. What he'd say to us is already in the book. You got that right there in front of you, probably. Let's all stand. Just take a brief moment. Close your eyes for a little bit. Just think about where you're at with the Lord. That's the main thing, right? I mean, have you claimed mercy? Have you claimed forgiveness? Even when you woke up this morning, you know what you did last week. I mean, haven't you cleaned yourself up before you come to church so you can get something? I mean, please do. The best thing ever happened to you is if you get right with God. Stay right. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for this dear country. Uh, thank you for Israel. Father God, I pray that you'd use us in these last days. I pray it is. And uh, dear God, I would really ask that your spirit would move and revive us in this church. Revive us in this nation. And we beg you, Father, beseech you that your spirit would move in a way that we would just burn in our hearts towards you, Father, and serve you. I pray, God, that you'd purge our mind from wicked works. God, I pray that you'd purge these people in here, that you'd show them what convenience is and what sacrifice is. And, Father, dear God, we ought to have a reverse thinking on these things. We ought to praise sacrifice and worry about convenience. 
pray that you give each and every one traveling mercies. Let them have good fellowship today. I uh, pray if there's anybody on the road that you get them here safely. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.